Hey, welcome back to this old dividing head. I was looking for one of these for quite some time now. This is a Walter 80mm center height dividing head. The type is UTA80. 80. 80 is center height and UTA stands for universal dividing head. It can do direct indexing via this, I think this is a, a 24 hole uh, plate. It can be used here with this plunger. You spin it and then you engage this and it's it's indexed. It can do indexing via uh, warm gear as as you as usual with an index plate. And this one also has the external drivetrain or the ex the, the, <laughs> the PTO shaft to to drive the indexing disc. That's used for two purposes. One, differential indexing, which I miss the accessories, which is a banjo with change gears, but it can also be used for spiral milling. It's, then it's driven by the table power, power feet of the mill. Uh, I miss those accessories too. But mainly I wanted this thing to be as a, as a normal dividing head. Not sure if I ever need to do spiral milling or differential indexing. But still, this is very nice that you can um, position the index plate. Even with the pin engaged, like this. And that allows you to zero out your... Uh, to index a part to zero with the pin engaged. Which on my import rotary table with the index plate is not possible. Uh, as an added benefit, it's heavy as can be. It's about 25 kilograms. So it's really heavy bugger. This is the smallest one of these. Uh, they made them up to 320 millimeters uh, height between table and center of spindle. So the larger ones really are heavy. You need a crane to move them. I looked at a 120... Um, a 125 millimeter one of these and it's about double the size it's it's ridiculous large the cool thing is when you loosen these two nuts back here whoop, this can go all the way to 90 degrees uh, it's a little it's all very sticky i already hosed it down with wd-40 to make it moving but I definitely have to take it apart and clean it thoroughly. Um, it also came with, with the original Walter uh, street chuck, the 100 millimeter chuck, with the integral, <laughs> with a back plate that fits the spindle nose of this dividing head. The internal taper is Morse taper 3, and the external taper is a short taper with, with with facial contact like like on a, a cam lock spindle uh, same taper seven seven degrees seven seconds and well, seven seven degrees seven minutes and something something seconds uh, same taper as on my lathe just smaller but I have an idea for that. Um, I'm going to make an adapter plate that matches this taper and the face contact and has the male taper of my lathe on the other end. So I can take my lathe chucks off the lathe and put it on here without losing, without having the part, the part to be re-dialed in. Also, that allows me to use the 6 jaw chuck, my 5C collar chuck, my soft jaw chuck, and the magnetic chuck if I need to, which will be cool. So, I'm going to make an adapter, but that's a little more work because I have to do some engineering to, to figure out how it fits this, this dividing head and how the, the whole pattern will match up. I want to make it as low profile as possible, of course, because any additional overhang will make it less stiff. I'm not sure about the bearing arrangement. Some of these dividing heads have had a large conical uh, plane bearing, 
and some have needle bearings for, for the main bearing in front here. The back, I think, is always a tapered roller bearing. But we'll see that when we take it apart. So, uh, yeah, let's begin. I think I'm, going, I'm, I'm starting to, to take off all the small parts. I can be lost or broken otherwise. That's, that's the index pin and, and hand crank. And here is the, the spring, the, the spring steel spring for the sector arms. And then we can take off these three screws to remove the index plate. It came only with this index plate. I will see if I can get the other ones. They show up on eBay all the time, but I have to see for the right size and hole count. Okay, so far this thing goes apart quite nice. Okay, here is this is the lock, the split lock for for the mounting point of the index plate, which is connected to the to the PTO shaft back there for spiral milling. <laughs> yeah, of course it's not a PTO shaft. Just joking. We have some rust in there, not, nothing, nothing really terrible so far. That's a very long screw. Oh yeah, that's a mad tight fit, which, is, which it needs to be to remain precision when you adjust it. And there is this clamping collar. This has some rust on it. I think I will pull off this whole housing here next. This should come off to the side. It's, it's bolted on with a number of screws and also pinned. On screws that you're uncertain if they are screwed in like crazy, do not use a ball end uh, Allen key. The, the ball can break off and get stuck in the hole. <laughs> Which is really a pain to get out. Okay, let's see if this comes off. Probably not. Give it a... Oh, there it goes. Of course, it's stuck on the dowel pin over here, as usual. Hmm. If I remove this piece here, which clamps the dividing head for, for the angular alignment, I probably can, can remove it easier. It's screwed from the bottom and, and, and front position. To adjust it, you only have to loosen the front one. Uh, there's a lot of oil coming out. Uh -huh. I hope this doesn't end in the, in the Exxon Weld S uh, situation here. There it is, should come off. Yeah, there it is. That's the the clamping element. Very nice machine in, in the inside, and this here is ground. And there is the smell of old oil. Oh, there it comes. There it is. Whoops. Okay, we have a gear. Oh, <laughs> whoa, we have a number of gears in here already. We have a warm gear here, or a screw gear, sorry. Screw gear is 90 to each other. And we have a... That's odd. That's a conical spur gear. Uh, I'm not sure if I have, I have seen that before. So, quite some time later now. I took all apart off camera. Um, it's, it, it just takes too long with the camera in the way. Got it all out, um, inspected all the parts, they're all looking very good. It was used indeed, but not really bad. Um, interesting design feature, uh, that's the spindle. 
with the short taper mount for the chuck here and it has two tapered seats here and here uh, the whole spindle is hard on the ground these two tapered seats are the plane bearings and the mating taper is, is bored machined and scraped to match uh, here in the housing it has the rear taper and the front taper and this is a little bit like the Harding 5C quick indexers. Those have also a, a large tapered bearing, plain bearing, and when you lock them, the spindle gets pushed on the taper, it's a locking taper, and then it's metal to metal contact, and it's not going to move. Same, same deal with this dividing head here. This is the lock. When you, there is a lever coming in from the side, and when you actuate it, this comes out and down and pulls the whole spindle by a tiny, tiny amount back and into the taper and seats it. It seats it. it it's locked. <laughs> um, that, that's, a, that's a very, very nice design. Uh, ex I expect very, very much rigidity once this thing is locked and doesn't go anywhere. Uh, the casting cleaned up nicely. The, the paint looks okay i'm definitely not going to repaint this uh, what's odd is either this has been repainted because there is some some green on here some reseda green uh, Rall 6011 but i don't think this thing is repainted it's it's done too good either the 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 undercoat they have is this ugly green or they all are painted in this green and then as per customer request are painted in this in this hammer gray um, another another thing that shows me that this is not a repaint is because uh, none of the circ fittings or oil fittings here are over painted the the, the plaques here are not over painted like a graduation here is not painted, so it's probably a factory job or a very good uh, secondhand uh, repaint. Uh, the rusty engraving here cleaned up very nicely with a Kratex rubber stick and some WD-40 cleaned up really nice. Uh, I didn't do anything to these large round bearing surfaces, those are now I have only some discoloration from sitting so long with oil. That's okay. Um, the bearing surfaces look also, the scraping is fully intact. So this is the warm assembly. I pulled this, it didn't pull this apart. Um, that there is nothing in it. There are two bronze bearings, the warm that's hardened and ground. And you can adjust the end play here with, with this fine thread. The end play of this here. Uh, Currently it's a lot because it's not assembled. I just cleaned this. The cradle where this goes in looks looks very good. Um, the scraping is... I'm not sure if this is, this is a factory scraping job. Uh, I doubt it. And at one point I definitely will scrape this. But for now I will just reassemble and use it. Um, I need to learn the inner, ins and outs of this dividing head first, which I basically did now by <laughs> pulling it completely apart. Okay, get it back together so it moves nicely. And it also locks very nicely. I, repra I replaced the 14 millimeter uh, M8 nuts with modern M8 13 millimeter. And this, this this doesn't move. This this clamping area here is so large, it's not going to move. Uh, this is basically like a long lever with the point over here and with the fixed point here, and we're strapping this over the whole half the diameter of the part. And ugh, this is a tremendous solid way to lock something that's rotating. And if you open both, you can move it. Here is the spindle and here is the massive uh, bronze warm gear. 
And the way this gear is fixed, the spindle is quite interesting. It's fixed with set screws, which is normally not a very, very good way to do this. They work loose over time. But they have done it properly, seriously properly. Um, they have two screws that come in from the side. Let's, let's show it that way. They come in from the side, almost tangential to the diameter of the of the part of the uh, spindle here, and it has two flats machined on here, where it basically clamps on, and it's really pinching the section of the spindle. That way, it also doesn't disturb the diameter of the spindle, which is quite is a good design. And then they have two angles. It, it goes in this way. Then they have two angled screws, and those press up against those angled pockets here and over here. And this pushes the warm gear up against the shoulder. And that should, in theory, be a very, very rigid situation. Uh, a little bit hard to mount because you have to tighten these screws uh, inside the housing of the dividing head. <laughs> so that's going to be a lot of cussing. The dividing head came only with this one dividing plate. Um, didn't get any additional ones with it. And this one is even a specialized one. Uh, the number of holes on this plate um, this is special accessory. The, the plate that came with the dividing head was a <laughs> had more useful um, hole numbers on it. Uh, this one had to be ordered separately if you had to do uh, odd number. I, ha I have to look up which one, which divisions this one was for, but um, not very general use. So I, I looked on eBay. I looked for Walter index plates, but I couldn't find uh, plates in, in good condition or even plates at all. So I ordered two hot rolled mild steel plates, slightly thicker and a little bit oversized. And I'm going to make uh, two blanks for dividing plates and one will get drilled already. I will keep one spare for whatever, um, just in reserve, but one will get drilled. I really like the rotor brooch for large diameter holes in not too thick material. Uh, they cut quick and do not exceed as much load on the machine as a similar size twist drill would. Okay, you saw me prepping the plates, um, turning the ID, OD and the two faces, and they're done. At first I wanted to drill them on my CNC, on the Stepmore CNC router, which is reasonably rigid and would be able to drill this without a problem. But I want to make this, this index plate once and I want to make it properly. So um, the, the CNC doesn't position in X, Y that accurate. So if you go around in a circle and you drill a, a, hole, a, hole, a bolt hole circle, um, you will get X, Y deviations. That means you get a, when you use this plate later for indexing, uh, you get an indexing error. It's 40 times less on the actual part than your error on here, 
but it's still an error and if I can reduce my errors from the beginning I will end up with a better part in the end. Um, I hear often work only as precise as needed and as sloppy as possible but in my mind that's that, that is utter BS. If you want to make precision parts you have to start properly you have to do everything proper and we're doing this proper here. Um, so I put the, the more more precision rotary table on my mill and I'm going to drill this the old-fashioned way using uh, the vernier scale on the rotary table. The rotary table is six arc seconds error which is a few microns over a distance of a meter that's okay. So I want to drill I need 12, 15, 16, 17, 19, 21, 23 and 27 uh, holes uh, whole circles on the, on the index plate. So I, I, I made the spreadsheet in, in LibreCalc, Libre which is like Excel, Excel just um, uh, open source and free. And I had it calculate the, the steps for each hole in, in a degree of angle, arc minutes and arc seconds. On uh, tw 12, 12 divisions, it's of course only uh, full degree increment, 30, 60, 90, 120. But when you go to something like 27 holes, you get, or 23 is a very odd one, um, you get 15 degree, 39 arc minutes and 8.8 .8 arc seconds. And we will use this sheet here to drill all the holes. I'm going to use a, a stub length carbide drill to drill the holes. In a perfect world I would bore each hole. I would use or, or use an end reamer. Um, both end reamer and boring, boring head will not follow the existing hole but they create, they cut true to the spindle of the machine uh, the hole. Which a normal reamer doesn't do. A normal reamer will follow whatever you drilled within limitations. Got the Moore rotary table here in the mill and I bolted an aluminum subplate to it using, using uh, just screws and uh, T-nuts and drilled and tapped the center for an M8 stud and bolted the index plate to this aluminum plate. So I'm off, off the I'm off the table and I can drill through. I have the part centered on the rotary table and I have my spindle of the mill centered over the part. And yes, of course, this rotary table is, is orders of magnitude more precise than this whole milling machine. But for what I'm doing, I can still use the advantages of the precision of this rotary table. Uh, the only two things the mill has to do is to step over to the desired radius, which, which doesn't have to be crazy precise. It will be relatively precise because the, the linear scales and the DRO. Um, and the drilling. The drilling is okay. Um, the, the quill on this machine is very tight and the spindle runs very true. But the, the actual uh, dividing precision of the index plate will all be from this indexing head or from this rotary table. As you can see I do not have index plates for this uh, Moore rotary table. There were index plates available for it but I do not have the setup for them. Um, but it has this beautiful large dial and vernier to set, uh, set your angles. Okay, this is the dial and the vernier of the rotary table. Down here, the dial, the numbers are in the in, in arc minutes. It goes from zero to sixty or zero, and then it starts over. So each time you go from zero to zero, that's one degree on the on the rotation of the rotary table itself. Uh, these are full arc minutes, the longer lines and the shorter lines in between, that's 30 arc seconds. That's half a, a arc minute. 
and combined with the 0 to 30 vernier up here, we can read down to one arc second with this thing, which is pretty crazy. Uh, which is more precise than rotary tables itself is spec'd for. Rotary, rotary table itself is spec'd for, I think, six arc seconds. All this is pretty crazy. But this will help me to, to make those index plates to a very high degree. And when you hand crank this, this thing, uh, the problem on this rotary table is that the warm and the warm gear are matched. And you cannot disengage the warm from the warmed gear to freely rotate the faceplate. So to rotate your workpiece, to dial it into a center, you have to hand crank it, which takes quite some time. Um, on a more chic board, you could use the spindle to index the part. You, you would center up on the, on the rotary table and then put your part on and then use the spindle to sweep your part and locate it. On a normal milling machine that's not as precise because it's just a mill. Or in this case a Chinese mill. But I still use this technique to get it pretty darn close. I got it within 20-30 microns that way. And then I, I uh, hand cranked it a few times 360 degree all the way around to, to get it that perfect. And now it's time to put my favorite uh, audiobook on and drill about 160 holes. Here we go. Uh, we start here and then we'll march our way around. First, first one is 12 holes, which is pretty easy because it's a 30 degree increment. No weird things happening there. So let's go. Uh, I decided to go with a stub length. Uh, coated high-speed steel drill with a perfect new factory grind. Uh, running at 3000 RPM. So the problem with drilling index plates, um, you don't want to do an increment. You don't want to move 15, 39 arc minutes and 8.8 .8 arc seconds. And then re-zero your dial and go from there each time. You will add up your error like crazy and it will not match up in the end. You want to do an absolute. Uh, this is what we call in, in CNC programming absolute dimensioning. We start at zero. Uh, we start. We go for 15, then 31, and all the stuff behind. Uh, <laughs> then 46, 62, and we march our way through that way. And that way, we have maybe an individual error. Each one of them has a small error on the last few numbers. But the important thing is we don't add the error up, which we don't want because we're creating a master plate here. <laughs> so, and another thing, each time I'm, I'm, I'm dialed in a, a certain number, I will cross it off so I do not get any crazy results here. <laughs> well, let's begin. I set the correct radius, table is locked. My dial is on zero. Uh, let's go. I'm cutting oil. Um, collet chucks usually work best if you tighten them down. Next, 60 degree. There we go. And now we line up the zero with the zero as precise as we can.
I drilled the first four hole circles and now I'm drilling the 19 hole circle. I already drilled the 360 or 0 degree hole and now I have to dial in 18 degrees, 56 arc minutes and 51 arc seconds. In this case 52 because uh, we round up in this case. So let, let's see how we have to dial this in. We are at zero here and also zero over at dial. We unlock the table and we crank it to 18 degrees. That's easy. Just go 10, 15, 18. Okay, zero is zero. So we're exactly at 18 degrees. Now we need 56 arc minutes. Uh, 50, 55, 56. And now we need 52 arc seconds. For that we have to go half an arc minute, which are 30 arc seconds. And then we have to add 22 arc seconds, which is over here, right here, and now we just have to line up, this is 22, and now we just have to, to line up the next possible line with the 22 mark, and it's this one here. And there we go, that's 52, lock it. It had a little bit of backlash, so you have to keep in mind to work in one direction. Okay, I drilled all the holes with the stub length drill and this would probably be way good enough. Uh, a short, I checked some of the holes and with the short stub length drill the hole position to the spindle of the mill was within uh, 10 microns usually when I spun uh, an indicator in the freshly drilled hole. But if, if something is worth doing it, it's also worth overdoing it. So I'm using a tapered single flute cutter. That's right here in the spin like ground this on the D-bit grinder. It's basically a conical engraving bit with about 20 degrees back rake and a taper angle that is slightly smaller than the index pin of the index head. Um, and I'm boring all the holes to about half the depth uh, with the tapered uh, D-bit. And this ensures perfect concentricity to the spindle of the mill because a D-bit, just like an end mill, will not follow the pre-drilled hole. It will cut its own way. I couldn't cut with this into solid because it has no front cutting edges. It only cuts on the diameter and due to being conical that works and now I'm going all the way around and I uh, remachine each one of the holes to be a taper seat for the pin. And the angle of the taper in here is slightly smaller than the angle of the pin on the index so it only hits on top. Otherwise you would get a situation like a Morse taper and the pin would lock up in each hole each time you use it. Here you can see a drilled hole, only drilled without power feet. So finish is okay-ish, not perfect, but it's okay. And over here is a taper reamed hole with the D-bit and you can see there is a shiny band that's tapering down. And this, this is what's giving me the final precision of this index plate.
Here we can see the tapered reamer that I'm using. This is ground out of an old end mill, carpet end mill. Uh, just ground in half, ground the taper off. Uh, an included angle of 9 degrees onto it and ground the back rake of 20 degrees onto it. And that's working surprisingly well. You can't run it too crazy fast, otherwise it will chatter. I'm running it at 580 RPM and lots of cutting oil. So let, let's do a few holes on camera. Works like a charm. Um, here you can see the chips. I give it some dwell time and at the bottom of the hole so it really cleans up the, the hole. I'm running against the hard depth stop of the quill. Okay, got all the holes drilled and bored with the single point taper D-bit. All holes are finished, all went well. Last thing to do is to, to drill the three holes to mount the plate onto that whiting head. Uh, I could do this using the rotary table, but that's a lot of hand cranking for three bolt holes. So I'm using the, the bolt hole circle function of the DRO and I'm uh, moving to the whole position using the XY table of the mill. I think I have to change the setup a little bit. I have to add two strap clamps and remove the central screw because I'm interfering with the with this big washer here. Okay, I added two strap clamps and now I can remove the central bolt so I can drill and count the sink the mounting holes okay got the index plate off the mill and test fitted it to the indexing head here uh, looks beautiful. Just to compare, this is the original one. That's the that's mine. <laughs> the index pin fits into the the tapered holes beautifully and does not lock up. I will have the plate plasma cardboard nitrided. Usually, when you use the the indexing head, um, yeah, some people let the pin slide over the surface into the next hole, and that uh, messes up the the edge of the holes and damages them over time and you put material into the hole and um, that moves your index position over by a tiny amount. That, that just not necessary. So we will have this hardened after I, after I did all the deburring, cleaned up everything and engraved the number for the bolt hole circles. I completely forgot that. I need the numbers on here, otherwise uh, you're counting a lot. Uh, yeah, this is this is the the lock for the index plate to allow it to spin freely. That's especially useful if you want to align your work with uh, in relation to the indexing. That's important. My my simple uh, Chinese indexing head can't, or rotary table with indexing plates can't do that. And that's also used for differential indexing, where you drive the index plate. Yeah, the this drive shaft back here uh, out the the indexing spindle 
together with the manual indexing. Look up uh, compound compound indexing. It's it's explained in, in most machinist handbooks. So yeah, get this plate off, engrave it, deburr it completely, get ready for plasma treatment. Off camera, I already prepared this adapter here. Uh, this goes on to the number two short taper of the dividing head and has a, a number three short taper out here. And this allows me to use all my chucks from the lathe right here on this dividing head. Um, it's currently machined out of soft C45 steel, but I will have it plasma carbon nitride, which makes it hard and does not alter the dimensions. It's a little bit fiddly to get chucks on because there is very little space here for the, for the nuts. But it's, it's better than having a full set of additional chucks just for the dividing head, which is in my mind not a, not a brilliant idea. And I want to be able to use, for example, a six jaw chuck of my lathe, which is an adjustable chuck on here. Uh, yeah, I didn't show the, the machining of this thing. It's, it's pretty straightforward, except for the two tapers. Uh, and even those are not as critical. It's all machined from one piece. Uh, machine from both sides, cut the taper, and I left and I cut the taper in a way that when I put the other piece on here, it makes contact on the face first, and the, the taper has a little bit of side to side play. Then I put it on the surface grinder and I ground the flat on both sides down until the taper on each side had. A, hit the taper first and had about 0.01 millimeters of, of gap between the face. So when you tighten the bolts and, and the, the chuck with the taper mount goes on here, it hits the taper, then you pull it down and, and uh, the, 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 this shrinks and the other part goes a little bit bigger because everything is made out of rubber and then it makes full facial contact and then it's a very rigid mount. For light duty work, I definitely can put the dividing head in the vise and hold it that way. Um, also that way I get an, an insane amount of center height if I have to machine, for example, a large gear. Uh, that way I have about uh, 150 millimeter center height. But holding it in the vise does not help with rigidity, that's sure. Um, this is not as rigid as if it was bolted to the table. And also I'm limited in the length that I can machine because I have the Y's usually in the center of the table slightly to the left. But still with the overhang that doesn't leave much travel out here. Maybe, eh, maybe that much. But in a lot of cases when you machine large discs for example that's okay. What I lose is um, height above the part when I, use, when I tilt the spindle. Then, then uh, my, my C height of the mill gets very, very small in a hurry. But it's a possibility. It's, it's all about possibilities. This is a very quick, very fast setup. It looks like a lot of overhang, but keep in mind um, it's compared to the lathe even a little bit less overhang to the front bearing. Uh, on, on, the, on the lathe the, the spindle sticks out a little bit more before the flange. So I'm not too worried about this. Um, the front tapered bearing here once locked is crazy rigid. It, feel, it, it really makes a, a I'm not worried. Let's let's phrase it that way. Um, I, I kept a, a small pin here in the chuck, and I'm going to to use an indicator to check the deflection against pressure. This is a two micron per division TESA indicator, and I'm going to put as much pressure on to the end of the chuck with my thumb as I can, and I barely can move it. Uh, 10 microns.
maybe maybe 12. Uh, that's a little bit more than on my lathe, probably because of the bolted connection between the the adapter and the spindle of the dividing head. But I'm I'm very confident that this is rigid enough to do it, to do reasonable machining out, out here. And here is the dividing head mounted off to the side. With the large chucks, I can the vice interferes. But if I have to use it on an angle, that works. Otherwise, I have to pull the vise off the mill, which I prefer not to do. And I can always, which is also an option, use tooling that goes into the Morse Taper 3 socket. Uh, I have a ton of Morse Taper 2 tooling, so I'm going to get me a, a good quality reduction sleeve MT2 to MT3. So I can use, for example, my, my small diameter collets directly in the spindle of the dividing head. So I think that's it for, for now. Um, I'm talking now for way too long about this dividing head. I hope you enjoyed. hope the, the, the minimal uh, machining content I showed was interesting. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.